Welcome to the 4 Before Canada podcast. I'm your host, Wes. And today we have a really neat episode for you. Last week, we were talking with Ray and Marianne from the BC Overland Rally about the, the BC Overland Rally happening on July 11th to 14th in Kelowna, BC. What you're going to hear today is sort of an off spin of that. I cut this out of last week's episode because we're getting a little bit long on time, but I feel this story needed its own episode. It needed to be heard outside of the BC Overland Rally episode. What we're going to talk about in very shortly here is when Ray and Marianne and their three boys in 2013 drove a 1950s Series 1 Land Rover they found in some farmer's field. They shipped it over to London and went from London to Singapore. And what an incredible journey. Trust me, you're going to love this episode. We talked about people. We talked about the ingenuity of trying to fix a Land Rover in the middle of Turkey or Iran or India, all these different places that they went to. And I found a really interesting discussion. Before we get into that, though, we've got to do a little bit of housekeeping. As mentioned earlier, last week's episode was with Ray and Marianne, BC Overland Rally. If you have not listened to the episode yet, go back a week, check it out. It's definitely worth listening to. We talk about all kinds of the reasons why people come there, right? It's an annual event that people come and see old friends, meet new friends. It's great vendors. There's all kinds of courses going on, incredible giveaways. But it all circles back around to people and the overlanding lifestyle. And it's an incredible interview with Ray and Marianne from BC Overland Rally. Next week, we've got Northern Ontario Off-Road Jeep Club coming up on board. we got a whole bunch of things coming up after that. Jason from Overland Alberta, he talks about Overland Alberta YouTube channel. He also talks a bit about the... Alberta Outdoor Adventure Expo, as well as uh, the Trails for Tomorrow organization, where he is now the current vice president. After that, we've got uh, a really fun and loving couple from True North Okanagan. Uh, if you guys have not checked them out on, on YouTube, you got to check them out, True North Okanagan. Wonderful couple. You're, we're laughing the whole time. And just when you watch the videos, you just, they're just a cute couple. They're really neat. And they're getting better and better with their youtube videos so check them out on youtube speaking of youtube a couple of weeks ago we had finding life's moments on and they actually came up and visited me camloops in and i showed them around and they're up here for a couple of days and there is so much great content that they decided to break it into two videos so last week they released day one and this week on sunday they're releasing uh, day two Check them out, Finding Life's Moments on YouTube. Uh, Hit the and subscribe button, and uh, you'll see some of the local sites that uh, I showed them around Camel's area. Coming up, we have on June 1st, there is a Overlander meet and greet in Vernon at Vernon Toyota. It's a third annual. It's a fun event last year. I went last year, checked it out. If you are going, you know, I'll be wearing my black and red for before Canada podcast shirt. So uh, if you see me, hit me up. Love to meet more and more people. Love to meet some of our listeners in person. And I'm really looking forward to this. I'm going to be doing some interviews with uh, both some of the people there, but also the vendors as well. And that will be a whole episode upon itself as well. So for more information, probably your best bet is check out Okanagan Overlanding on uh, Instagram and there's got more information on his page as well as poster but if you have any questions dm him i've heard there's some more people coming than last year so it's it's definitely gonna be a fun event for sure and as mentioned coming up in july we got the obc overland rally july 11th to 14th like i say go back to last week check it all out but in the meantime Listen to this story with Ray and Marianne about going from London to Singapore over the course of nine months in a beat up Series 1 Land Rover that seems to break down every three, four days, whatever it is. But I, personally, I can't imagine doing that trip in that vehicle, three teenage or preteen boys. And you just got to listen to the interview. I, I don't want to give it all away because I'm going to be honest with you, it was one of my favorite interviews this year so far. Let me know what you think. You've got a sickness in regards to your vehicles. It's an illness. We call it the Land Rover illness because, well, they're Land Rovers. 
Everybody who owns a Land Rover recognizes the fact that it's a love-hate relationship, right? Yeah, definitely. But you've been in Land Rovers for years. And I know that both you and Marianne have done some pretty epic travels around the world in Land Rovers. I know that you guys also made a trip. Was it from England to over to China or something like that with your kids? It was London to Singapore. Yes. Yeah. In a old Land Rover with a couple kids. Yeah, three kids. So it was a, three kids. Yeah. Holy jeez. It was a 1954 Series One that I got out of a field, and it's, I think I paid three hundred dollars for it. And it hadn't run for twenty years, and it had no glass, and it had no seats, and we basically we didn't bother restoring it. We just got it running. <laughs> and the day we got it running, I drove it to the BC Land Rover show and it caught on fire on the way there. So that kind of tells you a little bit about the condition of this truck. <laughs> and so anyway, but the next day we put it in a box and we shipped it to England. And then we flew over there, both of us and our three kids, three boys. They were like 12, 13, 14 at the time. And uh, yeah, we spent nine months in this little car. It's the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. And we yeah. drove from London all the way to Singapore. So we went all through Europe and through the Middle East and through Asia. And it was a pretty cool trip. And yeah, that little truck broke down every single day. Every day. We had a lot of really nice mechanics on the way. Yeah. But it was interesting. There was two reasons for that trip. One was we were recreating the original London to Singapore first overland trip that was done by a bunch of students from Cambridge and Ox- Oxford in 1955. And so that was fun because it was the same year and model of truck. And there's yep. not many of those. I think there's only like when I found it, I looked in the series one registry and they said there was only three of these left in the world that they knew of at the time. So we're like, well, we've got the truck, we should do the trip. But the other reason to do it was I wanted at an extreme level to just show that you don't need to put $100,000 worth of equipment into the newest, coolest truck to go on a camping trip, even on a big, long, multi-month camping trip, right? Yep. And because there are services everywhere and there's people everywhere. And and each of us had a little duffel bag, a little waterproof duffel bag for all of our gear. So one for each of us and one for each of the kids. And that duffel bag had to have your clothing, your entertainment, your pillow, your blanket, and your sleeping pad. The only thing it didn't have was your tent. And so we had a little tent for Marianne and I and another little tent for the three kids to sleep in. And I had one box in the back full of basic little kitchen stuff. I had one of those little MSR backpacking stoves. And I had a box full of tools, which was used a lot. And that's it. What else did we have? Yeah, that was it, really. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't have a fridge, but I had one of those those little soft coolers yeah. you can get at the yep. party. You can carry a six-pack. Yeah, we had two that was of it. them, right? We had two, we had two of those little things, I and that, that was that it. That was our fridge. Yeah, <laughs> and it was cool because it forced us to live off the land. Like, I, yeah. I, I couldn't pack groceries for a couple of days. Like, we had to stop and buy food for every meal. And, and people think, oh, if I'm going on a remote trip somewhere i need to carry all the stuff i need to carry a week's worth of food and but the reality is anywhere in the world where there's people there's food right mm-hmm. and yeah. you might be in a remote village somewhere and you don't speak the language but you knock on a door and you pull google translate out on your phone and you say is there somewhere in this village i can buy food and they'll go oh yeah and they'll point you to a house and you knock on a door and you buy something and Half the time, we didn't even know what we were eating, but that was cool. It was all part of the adventure. <laughs> we never got too sick, maybe in India, but but the rest of the time, we didn't get too sick. And But yeah, it was cool, and it forced us out of our comfort zone. It forced us mm-hmm. to rely on people, right? And that's the other thing, right? You can get a little too self-sufficient sometimes, right? We try to over-prepare sometimes when we go on an overland trip, especially a big trip. And we have this belief that, I have to be self-sufficient. I have to be able to solve every problem myself, fix my truck myself, cook my food myself. And But the reality is you don't, right? There's all these wonderful people in the world and they all want to help you. And so you, we were able to meet people at every meal because we had to. And yep. even if you weren't comfortable, even if you didn't speak the language, mm-hmm. you're hungry. 
So it forces you to get out there mm-hmm. and meet people. And then the car breaks down and you're like, okay, I'm in, I'm broken down on the side of the road in like Turkey or somewhere. And you're like, all right, I need to find a Land Rover mechanic here in the middle of nowhere in Turkey. And guess what? You can. You ask for help and people help you. And that was actually a really cool lesson, I think, for us and for our kids. Yeah, I think the biggest thing was the people that we met. And so everyone we met was so kind and generous and warm. And yeah, I think that that was the, the best thing. I think if you ask our kids as well, they'll say, we, we met so many awesome people, um, which reminds us that there are awesome people everywhere. We were in Iran, and everybody has this vision of Iran as like this big evil empire, right? Yeah. Yep. And we stopped at this little roundabout in a big city because my son wanted to get out and take a picture. And a taxi driver pulled up behind us, and he got out. And he offered in Farsi um, to share his breakfast with us. He saw this terrible little truck that we were driving, and he thought we must be so poor to drive this old truck that we don't have money for food. So he offered to share his breakfast with us. So we said, no, we're actually driving this truck by choice. And he thought we were crazy. But yeah, it was. Well, he's probably right. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally right. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, it was it was a really cool moment, right? And and just the fact of somebody being so spontaneously generous was really cool. Yeah, and that's we incredible. Getting invited to people's homes in Iran, mm-hmm. we we kept getting invitations to like uh, come home and have tea with us, and yeah, that's and, really cool. Yeah, and and once when we were stuck in Iran and. Ray was working on the truck with the mechanic. And then there was the guy who was helping us who didn't speak English, but his sister was a translator. So he brought her there and she was able to translate. And then it was going to be this long affair fixing the truck as it usually is. And the sister invited us to her home. And we yeah. and shared a meal with us. And when we left, she was like, some pickle, homemade pickle for you. And we got <laughs> two large jars. And it was so much kindness. That was a place for the, the alternator. So I remember originally the old ones that came with the generator, not an alternator. And at some point in its history, it had been converted to an alternator. Yep. And it had a big bracket, like a homemade bracket, which was holding this alternator in place. And at some point, we're like driving through these like bumpy roads through the desert heading towards where were we going shira or somewhere down there anyway kind of southern iran and that i think it was probably yeah it would have been somewhere down there anyway this bracket sheared off and so then we got ourselves to this little workshop and and these guys looked at this bracket and they said yeah that's actually pretty terrible design that was guaranteed to break and and they machined a new part for me they they actually took the time they dropped everything they were doing and they went to the machine shop and machined a new part and that was pretty cool we had the same thing in darjeeling in northern india we had the main seal on the truck failed and and like a local mechanic he said yeah obviously that seal is unobtainium but he cut the leather brim off of an old Gurkha military. <laughs> and he used it as a supplemental seal. He kind of wedged it in. And then he machined an overseal out of aluminum and bolted it in place. And that seal is still on my truck. Yeah, wow. Cool. That's yeah. just incredible. It's so fun. Like, people are so innovative when they have to be, right? That's the thing is they have to be, right? We're so used to being able to wander down to Napa or Lordco and buying a seal or something like that. Whereas... They just don't have that option there. So that's absolutely incredible. So Marianne, you're stuck in a vehicle with four guys from London yeah. to Singapore. Mm-hmm. How bad did that thing smell? Oh, badly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Some things that were like way more challenging. I was going to say, you probably couldn't smell the people through like the, the smell of burning coming from the engine. and oh, things like there, that. Were, there were things like before we left, we had to weigh every single thing including ourselves because the truck was so old 
and it, and it's a small little yes. truck. And oh yeah, and I, I felt okay. This is already going to be improbable that this truck is going to make this journey. And overloading it, which is the sin that most overlanders fall into, is not going to help. And yeah, we're, I, I said, okay, what's the actual capacity of this truck? How much can we take? And if it didn't fit, we just left it behind. Of course, within yeah. the first week, I think the rear springs failed anyway. And I had to get a new set of rear springs. But we were in England. So it was easy to find a set. So that was great. Right. And even <laughs> then, when we were traveling through the mountains in Italy, and there were these shops, and every time, the, the, you know, the, was it the tire would scrape? <laughs> the truck would lean. So when we were in England, the only set of springs I could find were a set of parabolic springs. And parabolic springs for a Series 1 are great for somebody who has a little Series 1 who doesn't load it up very much and just yeah. drives it to, like, car shows and stuff. They're very comfortable. But they're also not very stiff. And we had this thing loaded right up to the max. And so then we, yeah, we're driving through these little windy roads in, in Italy in the mountains. And every time we went around a corner, the truck would sway so far that the tires, <laughs> the rear tires were rubbing against the tub and almost rubbing a hole through the aluminum in the tub. And we all had to lean into each corner like we were on a motorcycle. Like physically. <laughs> and then also... The truck came with this hole where the where the passengers where your feet go. Yeah, and oh, yeah. somebody's misguided attempt to install yeah. a heater at some point, and uh, ended up with a giant hole cut in the yeah. bulkhead right in front of the passenger seat. And we didn't. I didn't really pay any attention to it until we crossed from England to France, and it was like, oh, I know why. It's because we crossed, and when we got to France, it was like four a.m. Oh, so very early in the morning, and it was so cold. And then the, the cold air was just gushing into the car. And I'm like, Ryan, what's going on? I think, you know? there was, I think there was rain spray coming through the I don't know. Well. But yeah. we were <laughs> going. So the only thing I could do was to take my bag and just put it against the hole and use my feet to hold it there just to stop me from coming in this unwanted air conditioning. <laughs> Uh, there's, but that's what memories are made out of, right? We can sit here and laugh about it today. So, so it was too cold in Europe, and then it was way too hot in Asia, in Thailand. Yep. It was like 40 degrees, and the truck has no air conditioning. And then, oh, so the truck broke down, as usual. And then somebody <laughs> comes to rescue us from Bangkok, and he's got his minivan, and he says, who wants to ride with me? And of course, my boys go, yes, we're going to ride with you. In the air conditioning. Air conditioning. And then yes. the traffic going into Bangkok, and it was so hot. And then the only thing we could use to cool ourselves down was to take our face cloths, wet it, <laughs> And just literally put it on our heads and make use of evaporative cooling just to keep cool. I can't imagine taking a Land Rover out of the field, getting it running, it catching on fire, then throwing it in a container, throwing it over to England and driving from London to Singapore. That just, it still just blows my mind. Like it just. I remember we were giving a talk when we came back at Northwest Rally. We were standing there at the campfire talking about our trip. We had a big map from showing people some of these places. Yeah. And, and just telling kind of funny stories about what had happened. And somebody at the campfire said, before you left, what did you think your chances of success were? And I thought about it. And mm -hmm. I said, maybe 30%. And Marianne turns to me <laughs> at the campfire. And she's shocked. And she says, 30%? You never told me that. <laughs> I was like... If I told you, you never would have come. So. <laughs> Some things are left best unsaid, right? <laughs> there were so many times on that trip when I'd get frustrated with the truck. In the middle of nowhere, and it's snowing, and the truck is broken, and I'm trying to fix it with my limited tools. And I would say to myself, okay, that's it. One more time. If it breaks down, I'm just going to take the license plate off, and I'm going to light it on fire. We're going to take a bus. <laughs> I know. It was, we finally made it. Yeah. It was an adventure, that's for sure. So what was that feeling like when you're pulling in, you're getting close to the end of your trip? Is it a like a bittersweet moment kind of idea? Yes and no. I think for the end of the trip was Singapore. And yeah. Singapore is still, it's a cool destination in itself, right? Yeah. But I think getting back to Canada, 
at the end of that, right, after being on the road for traveling in general for almost a year, there's actually something that overlanders talk about and they call it like an overland letdown or something like that. But it's like this feeling when you've done this epic trip and you get back to home again and and then, okay, now I'm, I'm back at my job and I'm sitting in my cubicle and it's, it's almost like it was a distant memory. It never really happened. And, yeah. uh, and it can be hard to adjust. A lot of people really struggle to adjust when they come back and they, they re-entry into society again after doing that big, long adventure. It seems silly, but it, it actually is. It can be difficult for a lot of people to, to get through that. It was awesome reaching Singapore. Uh, especially because Singapore was the place where our Land Rover journey first began because that's when we uh, got our first Land Rover and we were very close to the Land Rover community there. Okay. So it was really nice reaching Singapore and there were people from the Land Rover community who, you know, who met us at the border. And then that evening, literally we got there and then got to Singapore. We we met them, had some, went to a hawker center, had some food with them. And then there was going to be like a, a gathering at a local pub. And my parents live in Singapore. So literally we got to my parents' place and said, hi, we're really sorry, but we have to go for a gathering. It was really nice seeing our friends again. Yeah. That yeah. was funny. Yeah. yeah. We thought it was going to be a little gathering and we got to this pub and they had rented the whole pub and they like, they made us drive in. It was like an outdoor kind of pub, right? Big patio. And they made us drive into the middle of the pub with the truck and parked it in the middle and everybody <laughs> had this big party all around it. It was pretty fun. Oh, cool. oh, that sounds like great. That was actually one of the other questions I had too. This whole overlanding and exploring thing is this something that has always been in the both of you is it something that happened after you met (laughs) so i the first time i camped was when i was in my 30s and i had the boys were still little yeah we had made a conscious decision that we wanted the boys to grow up comfortable in the outdoors and I had to go camping and I had to learn how to camp while I had these three little boys. And we lived in Singapore at that time and we would camp in Malaysia. And it, it's it's quite a journey to be comfortable camping. I, and for me as an adult, and I still re- remember the first camping trip that we went, I had to bring everything from Singapore I had to bring jerry cans of water from Singapore. And I was like, okay, before you go to bed tonight, you're going to have to wash all this mud off you with this water from Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> and and, then, and that's how finally all these things and fears just fall away as you become more comfortable in the jungle and comfortable with the river. And then after some time, it's, oh, yeah, if you're dirty, just go into the river. Just yeah. wash yourselves off. And these crates that we eat on, let's just wash it in the river. <laughs> and and this is not a pristine river like we have at home here. Right? This is the brown, muddy, murky river, like a trail of mud snaking through the jungle. And, it, yeah. yeah, whatever after, it is, after they a while, clean up. We would just strip the kids naked and throw them into the river and hope the best. So. <laughs> good memories there that we learned from other people. Like the boys learned how you can watch the fish, tiny little fish, and how you can cut them from the sides and tickle their bellies and little things like that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I grew up in Prince George, right? And I, I came from a hunting and camping family. And so for me, going out and going into the backcountry was just something I grew up with. I can never remember a time not doing that. Yeah. And then living in Singapore and working in Singapore, which is where I met Marianne and we had kids, it's a city state. It's a concrete jungle, right? So if you want to go camping, and we did, so we bought a Land Rover, and, and, and that was a lot of fun, got a, a Defender 110 in, in Singapore, and we would drive it up into Malaysia and go camping. But it's the rainforest, right? Mm-hmm. It's serious, full-on Malaysian rainforest. It's not, okay, I'm going to go camp at the KOA, right? This is, I'm driving into the Endel Rompin rainforest, and there's tigers and poisonous snakes and elephants, mm-hmm. right? And and so it was a pretty cool experience. And I've got a picture somewhere of one of the kids sitting in like this little muddy patch of sand next to a river. And he's sitting in a circle made by panther tracks. 
which is actually pretty cool. And the whole kind of the experience was pretty cool. It was for me being a Canadian boy from the West Coast, able to camp in the jungle. That was epic. It was really awesome. That is so neat. So how did the BC Mountain Boy end up in Singapore? I actually went over there for work and I wasn't expecting oh. to stay as long as I did. But then I met Marianne and I ended up <laughs> for like 15 years. So, yeah. Oh. The rest is history, right? Right. (laughs) So was that a big adjustment, I guess, for you, Ray? Was that a big adjustment when you moved back to Canada? And same thing with you, Mary. You're going to a whole new world, basically. Was that a big adjustment moving back for the both of you? It was. I think there's two things. We didn't move straight back to Canada. We moved to to New York. And so we lived in New York City for a while. And then I semi-retired and we moved back to B.C. And it was a different experience because when I lived in, I was in Prince George when I was younger, and then I went to university in Vancouver, and I lived in Ladner, and it's all very urban. And then when we moved back to Canada, we wanted to capture that kind of Canadian outdoors experience. And rather than going way up north, we decided to, we went along Highway 3, and we got a little cabin just past the Hope Slide in Sunshine Valley. And this is a long time ago. This is about 15 years ago, something like that. Mm-hmm. And in those days, Sunshine Valley, there was like 70 residents, right? And there was nothing there. There was Now there's a big RV park and a ton of stuff. Yeah. But in those days, it was just a bunch of little cabins that were remnants of an abandoned ski hill back in the woods, right? And so that was pretty cool. We had bears walking through the yard and the kids would be able to just, they'd literally get up in the morning and they would push their dirt bikes out the front door and jump on them and go riding up the mountain. Right? It's an experience you struggle to find these days in Canada, right? Yeah. And yeah. even if you go to smaller communities, you really have to be out on your own to have that sort of very rustic environment. And so and we wanted the kids to have that experience. We wanted them to see what it was like having that Canadian, very rural uh, experience. And I, I, one of the things for me living in Singapore and then living in New York is I really miss the mountains. And Sunshine Valley is great. It's a little tiny mountain community. You're tucked in the hills mm-hmm. and lots of shoveling snow. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I think we've got on average 18 feet of snow every winter. And then that, and we have this terrible local cab. It was awesome, but it was awesome and terrible at the same time. And the little ski captain that was built probably in the 50s or 60s or something. And it had no insulation and it had been added on and it had three fireplaces in it scattered around three little wood stoves. And we heated this place with wood. And you'd go out to a clear cut after the logging company has left. And I'd hook up my winch and I'd skid logs out to the road. And we'd be bucking them into eight foot pieces. I could throw them on my trailer, bring them back home. And then basically cut and buck all this wood, probably five or six (laughs) cords for the whole winter. And like that. And then not just getting the wood ready and drying it, but then physically heating a whole house that size just with wood, it's a full-time job. Like somebody (laughs) tending that stove all day, right? And And at night too, right? (laughs) You learn a lot about fire. (laughs) Yeah. So now we're going to, it's a little more, it's a little easier. We did it. Yeah. Then would you like to go back and live in a cabin in the mountains again? I'd be like, no, not really. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad that we had that experience, and I'm really glad that our kids had that experience. Yeah, every winter they could build their snow forts, and they would yep. build lean-tos, and just, yeah, it was, they, they, there was a lot that oh, yeah. they did. I got a set of tracks for one of my mm-hmm. Land Rovers, and then we would, in the wintertime, we would drive up oh, to yeah. the old abandoned That's ski right. hill, which is called Silver Tip. Oh. And then the kids would all jump out with their snowboards and their skis, and they would ski down the hill and yeah. chase them in the track. Oh, that is great. <laughs> Do you guys still get out camping much? I know you, you got, you're really busy. Yes and no. Not as much as we'd like to. We, we, we camp when we're at the rallies. That's always nice. To be able to stay on the field and see everybody. I do a lot of travel for work still but I don't really get a, a chance to camp when I do that typically. Right. Um, but yeah. we do try to get together with friends, friends that we've met from the rallies, vendors, that type of thing. Some of the ve- And a lot of the vendors have built great relationships with each other by coming yeah. to the shows and meeting each other. And a lot of them will they'll send out an email and it'll be like, hey, I've got this idea for a cool trip and who wants to come? And half a dozen people will put their hands up. 
and yeah. uh, and we'll all go on a camping trip. So that's actually pretty awesome to be able to still do that. I wish I could yeah. more of it. At some point, I'll be able to retire and camp all the time, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, I'm there too. I can see it on the horizon, but it's still another 10 years away or right. whatever it is. So it, but I dream about it every day when I go to work. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah no, I, I love not just the camping part of it, but like some of our best holidays. And we've, we've got some cool holidays where we've flown into somewhere cool and lots of history and culture and that. Like, but some of our best trips have been just like driving down to Baja with the kids for Christmas and New Year's. And, Yep. And spending two weeks just camping along the beaches in the Sea of Cortez and meeting people and and eating the the amazing food. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Like um, double your weight, yes. and double your body weight in tacos. Yes. And <laughs> and <laughs> well, folks, what did you think of that interview with Ray and Marianne? I tell you, I had so much fun, and it just makes me want to travel even more. Where they're talking about the people and the connections that they've made over there. Love the interview. If you would like to be a guest or you know somebody that you think would be a great guest on the show, uh, another Canadian, hit us up on either Instagram at 4 Canada or our website. We do have a spot where you can fill out a quick form and uh, email us. And we would love to have more guests on. And we're not just talking about overlanding. We're talking about all kinds of things. We've had everything from off-road racers and mud racers and desert racing, uh, just general 4 by 4 people, as well as companies. We want to help promote and support Canadian 4 by 4 or overlanding related companies. So if you would like to be a guest or you know somebody who, that you think would be a great guest on the show, hit us up and we'll see what we can do. Until then, thank you very much for listening. My name's Wes and we'll talk soon.